Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Yüksel. As I said, I'm from IBM Research. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, Ramesh and uh, Krish, for inviting me here. I'm very excited and uh, I'm looking forward to some interesting and fruitful discussions on microfluidics and uh, security of biochips. And also, for me, it's a little bit interesting, this setting. Uh, I, I spend most of my time in the clean room and in the lab, mostly underground. And the uh, first time I'm giving a talk on the 12th floor. So, <laughs> <laughs> so today I will talk about our microfluidics technologies. And uh, more recently, we started working on um, connecting these uh, microfluidic based biosensors to, to smartphones. I will talk about the, those portable devices. And also, we started working on um, how to protect those uh, technologies against counterfeiting. But before going into more details, um, I'd like to say a few words about our group in uh, IBM Research in Zurich. Um, so, so we are located in Zurich, very close to ETH uh, University, and, and we have good collaborations with uh, other European universities. Uh, IBM Research in Zurich is one of the uh, 12 uh, IBM labs around the world. And Zurich is the first one um, outside the US. Our group is called Precision Diagnostics. Uh, it's led by Emmanuel de la Marche. And we have mainly um, three research projects. One of them is called Microfluidics for Mobile Health, which is the, the, the topic of this talk. Uh, we have another activity called Microfluidic Probe, where my colleagues use microfluidics technologies for local staining of tissue sections, so uh, for cancer research. And we have a relatively smaller activity on um, cell research. And uh, we have a very um, young and dynamic team, a very interdisciplinary team. Uh, we have electrical engineers like myself, uh, biochemists. Uh, we work on physics of uh, uh, fluid, uh, microfluidic devices, uh, the, the fluid dynamics, and personally, as a hobby, I'm, uh, I'm interested in uh, the, you know, this geek stuff, uh, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, all this smartphone connection, and um, we, we also work a lot on prototyping, so we, we in, in our research, we want uh, really um, physical uh, devices and uh, minimum uh, viable uh, prototypes. And I brought some examples here so we can uh, discuss during my talk and, or I can show you later uh, during the discussions. So when we talk about, um, so going back to the uh, microfluidics for mobile health, uh, when we talk about point of care diagnostics. So typically today uh, we have two major technologies. So when someone with a condition goes to a hospital, or, or, a, or a healthcare center, either they analyze the samples using these huge clinical analyzers, some of them can be as big as this room, or the other major technology is the, uh, what's called these rapid diagnostic tests. So these are very common in, uh, in, in emergency settings or ambulances or in, 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 in developing countries. Um, of course, they have advantages and disadvantages. So this is obviously expensive, and it consumes a lot of reagents and samples, but it's very precise, it's very sensitive. On the other hand, this technology is very easy to use, very cheap, but then it lacks some um, um, uh, precision. And there are many um, <clears throat> Um, startup technologies or even established ones like ISTAT and LRA um, using microfluidics to, to bridge the gap between uh, these two technologies. So they're mostly uh, portable or benchtop devices. Uh, some of them use um, what's called these lab on a disk technologies. Some of them use uh, uh, plastic cartridges. Uh, in the case of ISTAT, they use uh, state-of-the-art silicon technologies. In our research at IBM, we have a similar motivation, so using microfluidics to, to enhance the sensitivity, to, to make more portable and connected uh, diagnostics. But we, we also want to add a few more functions, like um, we want to add security, which I will talk uh, in today's talk and which is very relevant for this workshop, I believe. We want to add more connection to, to smartphones, so enhance interactivity with the, with the user. And obviously, at IBM, we're, we're strong in the data analytics and, and in cloud computing, so the idea is to, to 
to use these devices to send the data to to um, to, to our um, analytic analytics platforms. And when we talk about portability and connectivity, obviously we are uh, living in the in the age of connected devices. So I'm sure you all heard of uh, Internet of Things, and today there. Are about 10 billion connected devices, excluding our smartphones and, and computers. And this number is, is, is exponentially increasing. Um, we, are, we are using these healthcare monitors, uh, Fitbits, and um, activity trackers. And we have started seeing new regulations from agencies like FDA on new uh, mobile medical applications. And I believe in the near future, we'll start seeing such gadgets, wearables, or portable devices, not only for, for activity tracking, but, 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 but for infectious diseases, for, for uh, biohazards in, uh, in precision agriculture, or environmental monitoring, uh, drug discovery, and, and, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, it's a, it's a very um, diverse uh, application uh, area. And we think that the um, obviously, there, there are many different platforms and uh, technologies, but in our case, in our research, we consider uh, immunoassays uh, so that we can we can map uh, most of these applications uh, using a, a very generic immunosensing platform. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, immunoassays, uh, but maybe just a f few words about it. So, immunoassay is a is a biochemical test where you use antigens or antibodies. To, 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 to measure the concentration of, an, uh, uh, of a molecule. And very, very um, widely used example of this technology is, is a pregnancy test. So I always carry this pregnancy test in my bag. And I, I wonder one day uh, airport security will question me about it. <laughs> so it, it's a brilliant technology. You know, it's, it's simple in, result out, out. You don't need any uh, sample preparation. Uh, very easy to use, low cost. And the, the principle is very easy. So you have the, the analyte you apply. It tip, the, you have typically deposited um, detection antibodies labeled with uh, nanoparticles, magnetic particles, or, or, or electrochemical uh, labels. So the, it, it mixes. And use the wicking properties of the nitrocellulose membrane, so it, it, it moves with the capillary flow. And typically, you have lines of uh, antibodies, the test line and the control line, where these this uh, complex binds, and then you get uh, these uh, lines. Uh, you get the result, uh, typically yes and no type of result from the uh, from the uh, test, and. This technology is being used not only for uh, pregnancy tests, but also for many other conditions like malaria, dengue, or cardiac markers. Some of them are very popular in, in, in developing countries. Uh, and some of them, uh, like this uh, troponin uh, test, is being used in, in also in the Western world in emergency settings or, or at the hospital. But you can already spot some issues with this technology. It typically requires large volumes of samples, so it's not really a few microliters, but it's hundreds of microliters. It's difficult to optimize the, the signal geometry. Um, it's OK for yes and no type of answer, but it's, it's a little bit difficult to, to get a qualitative uh, result. Um, the flow conditions are not always optimal for a specific assay. So you have, uh, you have a paper that wicks, and you cannot very easily control the, the flow rate. And typically, each bioassay may require different flow conditions. So it's, it's difficult to engineer um, such uh, the, the, the requirements. And also, which is very relevant for this workshop, they are very easy to counterfeit, because it's only paper and plastic. So you can, uh, you can make one of these uh, uh, using your 3D printer. Or uh, yeah, I, will, I will show some examples. So in our work, um, we take the basic functions, basic principles of this lateral flow assays, and we map them to a high-precision silicon-based microfluidic chip. So we, we use uh, autonomous uh, capillary-driven flow. So we don't need any tubings or any pumps. Uh, it's all autonomous. We 
We integrate all the reagents, so it's a one-step assay, so you don't need any premixing of reagents, so it's a uh, sample in, result out type of assay. And as I said, more recently we started making these chips uh, uh, smarter with the, with the smartphone communication, and as well as we add security features uh, against counterfeiting. And we, over the years, we developed a, a library of microfluidic elements for, for many different functions. Fortunately, due to the time limitation, I, I will not go into all the details of different functions, but I will just give you a few slides on, on, each, of, uh, on each topic. So I will start with the, with the autonomous uh, flow. So how do we create an, um, a, a liquid flow in a, in, a, in a microfluidic chamber? So we use the, the capillary force for that. And if you, if you have, a, in this case, a, a rectangular channel which has, uh, which has uh, suitable wetting properties, you can easily create a, a pressure difference within the, within the liquid that pulling this liquid uh, towards the, 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 the channel. And it's very well studied, so the equations are quite straightforward. So you have the, the four channel walls and uh, the, the, the dimensions. And if you choose the right properties, right geometries, you can, you can create a pressure difference that would lead to um, a mass flow rate depending on the flow resistor. Um, sometimes uh, people ask, uh, okay, what about if you have a, a hydrophobic wall? You would just put all the numbers to the equation. If you get a positive number here, it doesn't matter if one wall is hydrophobic, slightly hydrophobic. So if you have um, strongly hydrophilic channel walls, and if the, if, for example, if the top wall is slightly hydrophobic, you can still get generate a, a capillary driven flow. And in our work, we typically start with the uh, electrical modeling, so I like this approach as an electrical engineer, so we map, uh, we use the analogy between microfluidics and, and, and electronics, so we simply map the, the, the design uh, to an electrical equivalent circuit. Uh, it's very similar, you, 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 have, you still have the capacitors, resistors, uh, voltage source uh, in, in microfluidics. Um, and then we design our uh, microfluidic chip architecture depending on the requirements and then um, we fabricate them uh, mostly using silicon uh, micro machining techniques. Of course, most of our microfluidic uh, architectures are also compatible with uh, plastic uh, manufacturing. Maybe we can talk about this later, but we, we mostly use uh, silicon fabrication. Also, uh, this is uh, one of the main expertise of IBM, so we use uh, our clean room facilities to fabricate those chips. And we developed a process we call Chipolite. Uh, you know, we're from Switzerland and uh, Switzerland is known for chocolate. Uh, so just to, to, to have this, uh, I mean, it's, it's very similar to, in fact, uh, the, the, the breaking a chocolate bar. So what we have here is, is a wafer. So we use standard silicon fabrication techniques to, to define our microfluidic chips. And then we partially dice the wafer. And then do all the surface cleaning and reagent integration steps still at a wafer level. And then we use a special dry film resist to seal them. And the sealing is done at 45 degrees, so it's about 113 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So it's, it's a low temperature sealing process. It's compatible with uh, integrated reagents. And then we simply break the chips uh, manually. So it's a very um, easy fabrication technique. And we used to use PDMS for our work, but we found that it's, there's no way to, to transfer the PDMS-based microfluidic chip to an, in, to the, uh, to an uh, industrial product. So that's why we switched to more uh, mass manufacturable products like this uh, dry film resist and uh, in this case we use silicon or glass as our main substrate. And here you see some examples from the chips. So this is the, uh, the full wafer after partial dicing and lamination and we have uh, some structures, uh, vetable structures, hydrophilic structures to, to um, drive the liquid. Yeah, yes, please. So all this is done in-house in IBM. Right, Let's say yeah. you have a smaller company, can they think of a distributed assembly flow here? Say somebody does the wafer and then the lamination and the, you know, the post-wafer processing, can it be done in Square? 
Yeah, sure. I think so. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I mean, uh, the the process itself is very standard. It's uh, in this case we're using SU8 as our main layer. So it's a uh, one mask, SU8 patterning, sealing with the film using a standard laminator or industrial scale laminator, and then it's it's done. And uh, we also tested patterning. Um, S3 on, on polymeric substrates or, or glass, it also works well. So, I mean, you don't necessarily need a, a very high-end clean room. Uh, any any MEMS clean room uh, should be able to, to fabricate such such chips. Of course, at IBM, we don't do uh, any consumer product or, or commercial uh, product on this research. Yeah, so it's mostly prototyping. So now I'd like to show you a video how this capillary flow works. So in this case, um, we have um, a chip uh, about uh, here, uh, one by three centimeters, so it's about one inch here. So we apply the sample to this uh, loading pad, and all the rest is done by the capillary flow. So typically, we have a hydraulic resistor to slow down the flow. So it, it all moves uh, autonomously. So in, uh, with a defined uh, flow rate. So we first slow down with the resistor. And then we can, uh, depending on the application, we have special structures to integrate the reagents. So we have uh, all uh, this integrated uh, reagents. So uh, typically we have dried, in this case, detection antibodies in this region. And then we have nice mixing at the outlet. And then, again, depending on the application, we can split the flow into multiple branches. It could be a multiplex test. And each, each uh, assay can have different flow rates. And at, towards the end, we have it's, uh, the, the, the contrast is probably not good, but I can see it's, it's much better on the LCDs there. Uh, we have structures. Yeah, maybe those. Uh, yeah. And we, we have uh, special structures uh, where we have to capture antibodies. I will show you a few examples. And at the end, we have what we call capillary pumps. Those are hydrophilic structures that would pull the liquid at a constant flow rate uh, until the end of the, on the, on the test. And we can just uh, engineer the dimensions and the liquid volume and the flow rate for a specific application. So it's, exactly, yeah. it's, it's, it's fixed for chip, right? So you cannot program the, the... Exactly. I will come to that point. So if you know the, the properties of your materials, geometry, it's, it's not so difficult to create a capillary flow. The challenge is how to modulate it. Currently, it's, it's all uh, the design parameter, how to modulate it, how to stop it, how to change the flow rate. So we have a very uh, recent technology to do that. I will show you in a, a few minutes. And the, the other challenge is, OK, have to connect this to, to a, a, a smartphone. Uh, another challenge, have to integrate the regions. So I will show you uh, all these uh, in, a, in a minute. So the first challenge, uh, the integration of uh, regions. Because we want a assay, very easy to use, uh, sample in, result out. Yeah, thank you. And it's a very big problem in microfluidics. Have to put reagents. Uh, okay, if you're working with uh, external tubings, pumps, uh, you can, uh, or if you if you work with multi-step uh, microfluidics, it's it's uh, relatively easier. But if you want an, a one-step assay. Uh, you, depending on the on the test, you may need to integrate multiple reagents into into your system. And there are many approaches. Uh, some some uh, uh, particularly plastic manufacturers they, they prefer liquid reagents. But then uh, stability and the and the release of the, these reagents are are uh, may may have uh, may introduce some issues. Um, some use uh, dried regions. Uh, they have a better long-term stability. Sometimes people use hydrogels. So there are many approaches. So in our case, we use uh, dried regions, and we use special microfluidic structures uh, for controlled release. Fortunately, due to the time limitation, I, I will not go into so much details of uh, integration of detection antibodies, but I will, say, I will show you a few slides on how we integrate uh, capture antibodies. So these are the uh, the lines 
you see on a, on a pregnancy test. So how we can uh, create such lines in a much more precise way. And in this case, we use microbeads. So they are available in bulk quantities. They are uh, relatively cheap. And you can, uh, you can uh, coat them uh, with, with different uh, um, biochemical reagents, depending on the assay. They, they show the advantage of high uh, surface to volume ratio, so you can have also multiplex assays. And such beads are also compatible with uh, different uh, types of uh, biological assays, immunoassays, molecular assays, or enzymatic assays. So uh, in one application, in uh, one of our uh, projects, we use such beads together with uh, the electrophoretic trapping. And maybe I'll skip the details and show you the video. So here in this case, we have a microbead. We have some mechanical traps. And we have uh, electrical uh, 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 electrodes where we use the electrophoresis to trap them. So here you see microbeads coming, 10 micron beads. And when we turn on the electrical field, they just go and find the, the first available uh, spot. So we push the beads towards the uh, traps. And ha after doing this, we can do an analysis, and we can release them whenever we want by turning off the voltage, and we can retract them. So um, with that, we can, uh, for example, in a, in a typical application, uh, sorry, please. Yeah. How deterministic is that? Um, the, 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 the often, uh, if, you, if you wait long enough, like 10 minutes, you can, you can get the full array uh, populated. So if the come in, do you have any idea where they will go and in order? Yeah, it's, it's random. Yeah, it's really random. But if you, if you wait uh, 10, 15 minutes, uh, you can have the full population. But in this case, we were not so much worried about the, the, the distribution. So we would, we would do single beat analysis. And I will show you another example uh, in the next slide. So that was uh, using electrical field. In another application, we want to use only mechanical traps. And here in this case, uh, we have trenches in the chip. And we just put a, a small droplet of uh, sample uh, containing beads. This is during the fabrication process, uh, this step. It's not done by the user. It's done by the manufacturer. And then we flush away the excess beads. And only the, the ones in the, in the trenches, cavities, stay after the drying. And then again, we laminate them with the dry film resist, and the chips are ready to use. Here are some examples of uh, microbeads integrated into cavities. And those are integrated along the flow path. So the, the, the sample would pass through. And we, we implemented an assay based on this technology, a, a prostate-specific antigen. It's a, it's a biomarker for prostate cancer. Um, and you see the result uh, here. So we have beads. And this, the, or the, the, the amount of the uh, fluorescent signal is correlated to the, the amount of the, the PSA uh, antigen you have in the sample. And we achieved quite good uh, sensitivities uh, with this assay, but we still had some issues in the high concentration range. So it was, uh, was pretty sensitive, but we had some issues with the uh, dynamic range. And more recently, uh, we, we um, invented a new technique for the integration of beads. It's much more easier. We call it orthogonal integration of bead laces, or rib. And, if, and a fun fact, uh, so when I first uh, developed this technique, I showed it to my manager, Emmanuel. Uh, he's French. And he said, yeah, <clears throat> maybe uh, I should find an acronym for it. And he came up with the ORIB, which is uh, horrible in French. <laughs> <laughs> so I, initially, I thought maybe he didn't like the idea. He uh, was just making fun. but. Uh, uh, it's, it's a pretty, a pretty uh, easy technique, so you'll see in the video now. So we just apply the bead solution to these structures, and the beads self-assemble. So we get a very nice uh, layer of bead area. And those are, again, uh, would be same as uh, lines in a, in a um, pregnancy test. But you see, much more precise, and the, the, the advantages, the, the main sample would pass through these beads. It's very efficient for capturing uh, antigens. 
And then uh, we show some preliminary data on the, um, on the assay and you get the fluorescent signal directly from these uh, areas. And currently we are working on a troponin assay, which is, which is a, cardiac bar, uh, uh, a biomarker for, a cardiac, for cardiac diseases. And um, I, I, will, I will not show any results, but uh, this is a very generic technique uh, for, for uh, many um, uh, assays that may need uh, integration of uh, regions. Then I'll skip to the, the to the, to the smartphone communication part. So that was about the, the generation of capillary driven flow, integration of reagents, and we are also very active in the, in the smartphone communication. And the motivation was there to, to get um, more interactivity with the user. So the, a portable device, so I have some examples here, uh, where we would plug the chip, or the user plug, plugs the chip, and then pipettes a sample, and it, we can control the flow rate. Normally, it's very challenging in the capillary driven flow. I will show you how, we, how to do it. And we can also get feedback from the flow. So what is the exact flow rate? Uh, we can guide the user when to pipette, uh, when is the right time to read the data. Um, we are also working on uh, compact fluorescent readers, um, and also uh, some gadgets to, to add more security to the chips. And I'll show you some examples of that now. So the first idea was coming back to the uh, modulation of the capillary driven flow, because normally after you fabricate, you have almost no chance to, to modulate the flow. It just flows uh, depending on the, on the surface vertibility and the geometry. But here, in this case, we develop a technique we call electro gates. So this is not an analog modulation of the flow. It's more stop and go type of uh, modulation. So we apply the sample and we have trenches here that would pin the liquid so that you get uh, in, the, in the right, if you have the right geometries, you can get zero capillary pressure at this point. So it stops. And then by using an electro wetting effect, by applying a, very, a small voltage, we can, um, we can pass this energy barrier and then the, the flow would, would uh, resume. And we can do all this uh, via uh, a smartphone uh, user interface. Here, um, here's a typical chip we have. Again, uh, the chips, uh, I have some examples here I can show you later. So it's, uh, it's again about uh, one inch here in this uh, uh, dimension. So we have the trenches. Look, it comes by capillary driven flow and it stops here. And we can, uh, we can stop the, the liquid for, for up to 30 minutes. And we, we show that this works well with human serum, with, with biological samples, with, with uh, water, uh, not the eye water, but the uh, uh, drinking water. Um, it's compatible with, uh, with many known uh, uh, biological samples. And also it requires very low actuation voltage. So unlike classical electro wetting on dielectric, we don't have a dielectric layer here. That's why uh, we can do this actuation at a very low voltage. And it's compatible with, with the smartphone. And uh, I have the, the device here. So five minutes? Ah, yeah, OK, sorry. So maybe I, I can show you the, the gadgets uh, later on, maybe. So here in this case, yeah, we have the smart control, smartphone control. We select the gate. We can apply the protocol. We can stop the flow at a certain location, and then we can tell where to go. So the idea here is to make a very generic chip design, and um, the user would select the protocol and apply it to the chip depending on the application. And then we also work on uh, flow monitoring. We have another device to get the, the feedback from the flow. Here in this case, maybe I'll just uh, fast forward here. I cannot, okay. So here the idea is to, 
to get um, a feedback from the device because normally in such uh, low cost devices you don't have much uh, feedback on the actual flow conditions. So now the smartphone recognizes uh, when the sample is pipe 